Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 9, Remastered. In the previous two episodes, I've discussed the physiology of the cell, like its organelles, its cytoskeleton, its transport mechanisms, all that stuff. And in this episode, I'm still going to be discussing the cell, but I'll just be moving beyond the basic physiology to discuss energy acquisition and energy manipulation. After all, the complex physiological processes of the cell take a lot of energy to maintain. Things that I discussed in the earlier episodes, like active transport and the flexing of myosin proteins, all require energy. Enzymes are proteins that allow the cells to undergo various chemical reactions with a little more energy efficiency. Enzymes reduce the amount of energy needed to initiate a reaction. Okay, so before I get into too much detail, let me start with the basics. Let me start with the first law of thermodynamics, and some of the basic principles of chemistry. Primarily, what energy is and how it works on a molecular level. Now, you're probably familiar with kinetic energy. The energy of a moving particle, like momentum or acceleration, is kinetic energy, often called E sub K. Potential energy, or E sub P, on the other hand, is the energy of static objects that are in particular positions. A car at rest on top of a hill has high potential energy, because the car can roll down the hill and turn that potential energy into kinetic energy. But a car that's at rest at the bottom of the hill has no potential energy. It's not going to roll anywhere. It's already at the bottom of the hill. In a very similar way, a molecule whose configuration or structure is under some kind of torque or pressure or strain will have potential energy. This energy can be released or captured by easing the torque or the pressure that's involved. The myosin heads and muscle fibers can bind with phosphate groups to induce a powerful kicking motion. Billions of these myosin heads repeatedly kicking outwards collectively moves your muscles and allows you to walk, to stand, to throw a football, and do everything else. The total energy of a whole molecule and all of its parts, including its role in heat production, in the pressure of the solution, and the volume, is all called the molecule's enthalpy. Imagine that you're on a water slide at a theme park. When you sit on top of the slide, slowly inching forward, you have a very high potential energy. When you begin to slip and accelerate down the slide, your potential energy turns into kinetic energy. Unfortunately, a little kid is playing dangerously close to the mouth of the water slide, and when you come out of the slide, spewed out with this high kinetic energy, you smash into the little kid. Now, if the slide had a weak slope, and you didn't really get going that fast, you didn't have that much potential energy in the first place, and you never really developed that much kinetic energy, you wouldn't smash into the little kid with that much force. He'd probably be fine. He'd probably look at you and be annoyed and tell you to watch where you're going. But what if the slide was one of those really steep ones, or it had a spiral section that accelerated you really fast? In this case, you would have a high kinetic energy. And when you smash into the little kid, all of that kinetic energy gets turned into the mechanical energy of the impact. The kid is hit with more force, and instead of responding with a snarky comment, he responds by crying and running to go get his mom. Now this is kind of a comedic example, but it illustrates the point. On a smaller level, the atomic particles and the ions and molecules that all exist in biological creatures, they float around in their watery solution, smashing into one another and converting their kinetic energy into different forms of energy, like mechanical and thermal energy. If a solution that's full of particles is heated up, this energy input into the solution will make the particles move faster, they vibrate more, and they collide with more force. Thermal energy is being directly added to the solution, and it's exciting all of the particles within it, and it's increasing their kinetic energies. Differences in concentration can be used to create concentration gradients, which induces the directed flow of certain particles, and this flow, this concentration gradient, can then be farmed for energy, kind of like how a hydroelectric dam generates power from the current of the water. Negative and positive charges attract one another, and electrons have a negative charge. So when electrons are near other electrons, and they're far from the positively charged protons in the nucleus, then these electrons have a high potential energy. The negatively charged electrons will repulse one another, and they get attracted by the positive charges of other atomic nuclei. An atomic electron is also attracted to the positive charges in its own nucleus, 
An electron that exists in its valent shell, that is, in its outer shell, is far from its nucleus. Like the water at the top of a waterfall, this valence electron has a very high potential energy. When the electron falls down the shells, coming closer and closer to the nucleus, it begins to move faster. Its potential energy is being converted to kinetic energy, just like water in the waterfall accelerating down to the surface of the Earth. This is also analogous to the orbit of a moon around a planet, or a planet around a star. When the orbiting body is far away, it moves relatively slowly, and it has a high potential energy. But as it gets closer to the source of the gravity, it speeds up. That momentum is conserved, and the potential energy turns into kinetic energy. These examples show how energy is changed from one form into another. It's not destroyed, and this demonstrates the conservation of energy and the first law of thermodynamics. Now, when molecules react, their enthalpies can change as a result of the chemical modifications that are made during the reaction. This change in enthalpy is typically denoted as delta H, where delta is the symbol for a quantity of change, and H is the symbol for enthalpy, so it means a change in enthalpy. If molecules react in such a way that lowers their enthalpies, heat energy has been expelled from the system. When heat is released, the reaction is thus exothermic. The delta H is negative because heat has been released from the molecules and their enthalpies have been lowered. Now on the other hand, when heat is absorbed by a reaction, the molecules involved increase their enthalpy by absorbing the heat energy. These kinds of reactions are endothermic. The delta H is positive in endothermic reactions because the enthalpy of the molecules has increased. Besides enthalpy, there's also entropy. Entropy, represented by a delta S, is the amount of disorder or chaos that there is in a system. When molecules react with each other and they break apart into smaller pieces and heat is released, the disorder increases. The entropy increases. Now when molecules react and bind together to make larger, more stable, more complex molecules, the disorder decreases, and the entropy decreases. Now, in a closed system, entropy always increases, and the available energy always decreases. This is the second law of thermodynamics. Now, both the entropy and the enthalpy of a reaction are used to calculate its spontaneity. Some reactions occur the moment the reactants come into contact with one another. They explode violently, like a chunk of sodium that's been thrown into a pool of water. But other reactions can also occur spontaneously. That is, they can initiate without an energy input. But instead of reacting explosively, they react slowly, and they take a long time to reach saturation, or reactant depletion. In essence, a spontaneous chemical reaction is one that reduces the amount of free energy in a closed system, and thus creates disorder. Non-spontaneous reactions create order, but they require energy to get started. It requires energy to establish this order within a system that's increasingly becoming disordered. The equation used to calculate the spontaneity of a reaction produces the Gibbs free energy change, which is a variable represented by delta G. The equation is delta H, the change in enthalpy of the reactants, minus the product of the temperature in Kelvin multiplied by delta S, which is the change in entropy. A moment ago, I described a solution that's receiving heat energy, and how this input of heat energy is causing the particles in the solution to vibrate faster, and to move faster, and to collide with more force. When the temperature is high, the molecules are moving fast, which makes the amount of disorder relatively high. Because of this higher disorder at higher temperatures, entropy plays a larger role in the total free energy change of the reaction. This is why the temperature variable is multiplied by the change in entropy. So if you're looking at the spontaneity equation for a particular reaction, and you see that the delta G has a negative value, that means that the reaction is exergonic. Exergonic reactions will occur spontaneously, with no energy input. In contrast, if you're looking at a non-spontaneous reaction, then it's going to have a positive delta G value, and the reaction is endergonic. Because they're non-spontaneous, endergonic reactions require an energy input and or a reduced activation energy in order to occur. 
enzymes are life's response to this problem. Enzymes are catalytic proteins that lower the activation energy of a particular reaction. Many enzymes will exploit the energy released by exergonic reactions and use that to power endergonic reactions. When an exergonic reaction fuels an endergonic reaction in this way, it's known as energetic coupling. When two or more molecules react, what's essentially happening is that they're just hitting each other at high speeds. They're colliding with one another at some point within the solution. The molecules collide with each other at particular angles and orientations, where the electrons on various atoms can be brought into close proximity. If there's enough free energy in the system, a collision at the right orientation will lead to a reaction. When the concentration of the reactants is high, the number of these collisions between the reactants is also very high because you have them all crowding the solution. Imagine that you're playing bumper cars, but there's only one other person playing. If both you and the other driver just aimlessly bounce around, chances are you won't really hit each other that often. You'll spend most of your time just moving through the open area and bouncing off the edges. But if there was two dozen other people playing bumper cars with you, well, with that higher concentration of players, you'd be crashing into people every two or three seconds, on all sides. Just like with molecules in a solution, a higher concentration of them will increase the number of times that they collide and react. So in the bumper car scenario, if it's just you and one other guy again, you wouldn't bump into each other very often. But if you were to increase the temperature, it would increase your speed. So what would happen then? Instead of the awkward, jerky swerving of a normal bumper car, both of you are now in control of supercharged bumper cars that can drive really fast. Assuming that no one flips over or breaks their car or it explodes, you should start bumping into each other a lot more often, simply because you're covering more ground at a faster pace. When you increase the temperature of a solution, you're adding all of this thermal energy to all of the particles in it, and you're exciting them, and you're making them vibrate and move faster. Now you should understand why you can increase the rate of a reaction by increasing the temperature, or increasing the reactant concentration, or both. As a student of biology, it'll become very important for you to understand oxidation-reduction reactions, or redox reactions. In an oxidation-reduction reaction, one reactant will take one or more electrons from another reactant. The reactant that takes electrons is called the oxidizer, because it oxidizes the other reactant. The oxidized reactant is the one that loses its electrons. The oxidizer, the reactant that took the electrons, is reduced by taking on the electron's negative charge. The charge of the reactant has been reduced, meaning it's less positive or more negative. Just as the reduced molecule is called the oxidizer, the oxidized molecule is called the reducer, or the reducing agent, because it reduces other compounds. So you can see that this is a very dualistic, two-sided relationship. Redox reactions can also be understood from the perspective of the electrons themselves, as the electrons get transferred and shuttled between molecules. Electrons are often, but not always, shuttled on protons, or hydrogen atoms which means that a traded electron with its negative charge is often accompanied with a proton and its positive charge. The electron donor releases the proton-bound electron, which is then received by the electron acceptor. Recall that molecules that have a lot of carbon-hydrogen bonds, like lipids and carbohydrates, have high energy. When an electron acceptor binds to a proton, like in a redox reaction, it can increase the total energy of that molecule. But because this is a dualistic, two-sided relationship, this increase in total energy of one molecule also means that the electron donor molecule loses potential energy by releasing the proton and the electron. Consider this example of a very fundamental oxidation-reduction reaction that occurs in all living cells to produce energy. The oxidation of glucose to produce carbon dioxide, water, and energy. A molecule of glucose contains six carbons. When these carbon atoms are exposed to molecular oxygen, they can be metabolized in a redox reaction for energy. This redox reaction breaks apart the glucose molecule carbon by carbon, reconstituting the atoms into molecules of carbon dioxide. In the glucose molecule, the carbons share their electrons equally in all these carbon-carbon bonds. 
But in carbon dioxide, the electronegativity of the oxygen atoms pulls the electrons away from the central carbon. The carbon atom in the produced CO2 is oxidized, as it's effectively lost its electrons. In the water molecules, the oxygen atoms are bound to hydrogen instead of other oxygen. Because the hydrogen atoms are not electronegative, each oxygen atom can hold its electrons closer to itself, gaining them and effectively being reduced. Because the products, CO2 and water, have atoms that hold the electrons closer to their nucleus than was the case in the reactants, you know, glucose and molecular oxygen, the products have a lower potential energy and a higher entropy than the reactants. The reaction will then release heat, making it exergonic. In earlier episodes, I have referenced a molecule called ATP, or adenosine triphosphate. This small molecule is often used for energy because it contains a chain of three phosphate groups, hence the triphosphate. Each phosphate group is bound to four oxygen atoms. When bound together in a chain, the triphosphate group contains four negative charges and a dozen strongly electronegative atoms, all held tightly together in a very small space. Like electrons kept near other electrons, or just two positive ends of a magnet that you're trying to push together, these tightly bunched up phosphate groups have very high potential energy because they want to move away from each other. During a hydrolysis reaction, the outside phosphate group is cracked off, like someone taking a bite out of a granola bar. The products of this hydrolysis reaction are an inorganic phosphate ion, which was shot off of the ATP, and the remaining molecular compound, which is ADP, or adenosine diphosphate, which denotes the two remaining phosphate groups. Now, most importantly, this reaction produces a huge amount of energy from the broken bond. Cracking off that last phosphate group releases 7.3 kilocalories per mole of ATP. A kilocalorie is the quantity of energy that's needed to raise one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius. Recall that water has a relatively high heat capacity, which means it requires a pretty significant energy input to be heated. One mole, or 6.02214 times 10 to the 23rd power, molecules of ATP could then be cracked open to heat up 7.3 kilograms, or almost 16 pounds of water, by one degree. If you've ever boiled water on a stove before, you know that it can take a fair bit of time, and that's only the three or four pounds of water that you're holding in your stove pot. 16 pounds of water is like one and a half gallons. One and a half gallons of water can be warmed up a whole degree Celsius by just a single mole of ATP. That's an incredible amount of energy. Absolutely incredible. Especially since it comes from something so small, the little, humble ATP molecule. Now besides this amazing release of energy, the ATP hydrolysis reaction is an exergonic reaction because its products have higher entropy than its reactants. There's more products than there are reactants, which directly increases the amount of disorder, and thus entropy, in the system. The products also have a much lower potential energy than the reactants, which means that the total free energy in the system has been lowered. Okay, so right about this time, you might be asking, how does the cell actually capture and use this energy that's being released by ATP? Isn't it a bit like trying to bottle an explosion with your hands? The physics of chemistry aren't quite the same as the physics of our macroscopic Newtonian world. In an explosion on a Newtonian scale, a lot of the energy is released as heat, or it's released in the form of a pressure wave that moves outward from the source of the explosion. If the ATP released all of its energy like an explosion, then most of it would just be lost as heat, or as a pressure wave flowing through the nearby solution. Instead, the bond energy released by cracking off the phosphate group is used to smash it onto a new molecule. The act of a phosphate group being transferred from ATP to a new molecule is called phosphorylation. Upon binding to this phosphate group, the new molecule is phosphorylized. This addition of the phosphate to the target molecule, this phosphorylation, brings a very strong negative charge into the molecule's structure. This highly charged addition can then change the conformation of the phosphorylated molecule by reacting electromagnetically with all of the other electrons and charge atoms and whatnot that exists within the molecule. If a molecule requires phosphorylation to activate it or turn it on so it can do a job, 
Well, that molecule transitions between two states. An inactive state, where it's not doing anything, and an active state, where it is doing something. In most molecules, phosphorylation will induce conformational changes that make it more reactive. In these cases, the molecule gets activated and can then go around and do whatever function the cell needs it to do. But in other reactions with other molecules, this active state doesn't require a phosphate group. In these cases, phosphorylation will actually cause conformation changes that inactivate the molecule. So here, the phosphorylation is like an off switch, and it puts the enzyme on pause. In this way, phosphorylation can act as a regulatory tool for numerous molecules like enzymatic proteins. It regulates their function and controls when these particular things can do a job and when they're turned off, and when these particular things can start pumping atoms and creating a gradient, and when that needs to be turned off, and so on and so forth. Enzymes are a really amazing class of protein molecules. They're amazing for many reasons, but primarily they're amazing because of the breathtaking variety of functions that they can perform, and the reactions that they can catalyze. There's almost no limit to it. It really is incredible. Without enzymes, life couldn't function. There would be no life. Many of the chemical reactions that life depends on are facilitated by enzymes, and without them, they just could not happen. Enzymes are typically large, flexible proteins that possess specific regions in their structure called active sites. These active sites are proximal groups of amino acids with specific side groups that show an affinity for particular molecules. These particular molecules can bind to the active sites on the enzyme, which then causes the enzyme to change shape or to change conformation. This change in the enzyme will facilitate some reaction or some modification to the bound molecules, which reaches an unstable transition state between reactants and products. This transition state is very momentarily unstable because the original bonds from the reactant molecules are being broken and new bonds are being formed to create the products. Depending on how unstable this transition state is, it can be harder for an enzyme to make it happen. In other words, the more unstable that this transition state is, the higher the effective activation energy required to make the reaction go to completion. As I've said, molecules will bind and react when they collide at particular orientations, and with enough kinetic energy to overcome the activation energy of their reaction. The activation energy, or E sub A, is the energy required to initiate a particular reaction. Now, it usually doesn't take much, if any, energy to keep a reaction going once the initial energy investment has been made. But for non-spontaneous reactions, it takes an energy spike, like a match being lit, to begin the reaction. If two reactants are mixed together in a solution, but they don't have sufficient thermal or kinetic energy to overcome the E sub A barrier, they won't react. The reaction just won't happen. Now, the rate of a given reaction is heavily influenced by its E sub A. If the energy barrier is high, then the reaction is less likely to happen, and so the rate of the reaction will be slower. If the energy barrier is low, then the reaction is more likely to happen, and the rate of the reaction will be faster. In this way, both activation energy and the thermal energy or the temperature of the particles influences the rate of any particular reaction. However, even in a solution with a high temperature, a reaction may proceed slowly if the activation energy remains high. This is where enzymes come into play. Recall how a moment ago I mentioned active sites on an enzyme, and how they're full of amino acids with R groups that have an affinity for the molecules that bind to the active site. These amino acids have 20 different R groups that can be nonpolar, polar, acidic, basic, or positively or negatively charged. And so depending on the qualities of these side groups, and depending on the qualities of the reactant molecules, the active site of the enzyme could have any combination of side chains, designed to fit any number of reactant molecules. These R groups don't just stabilize the molecules with hydrogen bonds and polar affinities. They also facilitate the transport of various atoms, or groups of atoms, from one reactant molecule into another. Enzymes that facilitate oxidation-reduction reactions have basic or acidic R groups in the active site that help move the proton from the donor to the acceptor. 
Ultimately, this specialized active site allows the enzyme to bind to one or more substrate molecules and catalyze some kind of reaction between them. This process of enzymatic catalysis has three steps. Initiation, the transition state, and termination. In the initiation step, the substrate molecules come and bind to the active site. Here, the enzyme is able to manipulate the molecules into an optimal orientation for binding through an induced fit. In the second step, the enzyme is handling and processing the unstable transition state of the reactants to try and push them through to completion. The enzyme's conformational changes and R-group specificities help to stabilize the transition state, and they lower the activation energy. Finally, the reaction comes to termination. After the reactants have been catalyzed, and the product molecules have been created and have a low affinity for the active site that they are now stuck in, they detach and float away. This frees up the enzyme's active site to bind to new reactant molecules and do the process all over again. Now because this three-step process takes time, the enzyme can only process its substrate molecules so fast. There's a limited speed. If you were to plot the rate of an enzymatic reaction versus the substrate concentration, you would find that reaction rate tapers off asymptotically as the concentration of substrate molecules increases. When there's very little substrate, there's not going to be that many reactions between the enzyme and the reactants, and so the enzyme is only going to process the reactants as fast as it comes into contact with them. On the other end of the asymptotic curve, when there's a lot of substrate, the enzyme is basically saturated. It's working at full speed, and it can only process stuff as fast as it can get its hands on new molecules. If you add more substrate, the enzymes will be more and more likely to bump into reactant molecules and process them. But eventually, you'll get to a point where adding more and more substrate doesn't do anything. The enzymes in the solution are already saturated. They're already processing the reactant molecules as fast as they can. Continually increasing the concentration of the substrate molecules will then lead to smaller and smaller increases in the reaction rate until you reach this saturation point, where the rate simply doesn't increase no matter how much more substrate you dump in, and this is the top part of that asymptotic curve. Now obviously, you wouldn't put a single enzyme into a solution and expect it to process industrial quantities of substrate in any reasonable time period. Instead, you'd put millions, maybe billions of copies of your enzyme into the solution. You'd put in enzymes that helped your enzymes, and enzymes that helped those enzymes, and then enzymes that helped the whole enzyme complex. The point I'm trying to make here is that in living systems, enzymes don't work alone. Many enzymes have modular components, which are needed for the enzyme to function. Without these components, the enzyme can't do its job it would be in an inactive state. These modular molecular attachments are organized in three types. You've got prosthetic groups, you've got cofactors, and you've got coenzymes. The prosthetic groups are non-amino acid molecules. So think like some kind of weird transplant, like how plastic isn't part of your body, but if you get a prosthetic, well, now you have a plastic limb. <clears throat> With respect to chemistry, Prosthetic groups are like molecules like sugars or lipids that get bound to the enzyme. Cofactors are inorganic ions like zinc or iron, which engage in reversible reactions with other enzymes. Now, coenzymes are kind of like smaller little mini enzymes, and they're capable of limited but reversible interaction with larger enzymes. Much like the R groups on amino acids, these types of molecular enzymatic assistants, these coenzymes, can help to stabilize the transition state or shuttle around atoms. Some of these assistant molecules regulate the activity of the enzyme itself. Regulatory molecules are those that bind non-covalently, that is, through hydrogen bonds, polar interactions, and van der Waals forces. The non-covalent binding of these regulatory molecules to the enzyme can activate it or deactivate it. These molecules can also be released from the enzyme without really changing its structure, which is why they're called reversible reactions. Regulatory molecules can either bind to the active site or somewhere else on the enzyme. Those that bind to the active site 
must be similar in size, shape, and polarity to the enzyme's natural substrate molecule. It has to mimic it, in a sense. In a phenomenon known as competitive inhibition, the regulatory molecule will bind to the active site and physically block it, which prevents it from binding to the natural substrate molecule. This inhibition is competitive, because the substrate molecule and the regulatory molecule are both competing with each other to bind to the available active sites. If the regulatory molecule binds to anywhere else besides the active site, then the interaction is called an allosteric regulation. This allosteric regulatory binding will cause a conformational change in the enzyme. Some enzymes are activated when an allosteric regulator binds to them, which changes their shape into something functional. Alternatively, some enzymes are naturally active, but they become inactivated by the conformational changes that are induced by binding to an allosteric regulator. Now in some cases, these regulatory molecules do indeed bind covalently to the enzyme, or they involve modifying the enzyme by breaking some of its covalent bonds. For example, a protease activates the enzyme trypsin by cleaving off a small portion of the enzyme's polypeptide chain. That small little portion is kind of like a pause button, and so when it's cut off, the pause button is removed. It's like pressing play, and the trypsin enzyme is now activated. Phosphate ions are a particularly common cofactor in enzyme activation. The phosphorylation of an enzyme is basically the addition to the enzyme of an ion with a strong negative charge, the addition of this phosphate ion. The negative charges on the phosphate ion react with the polar and the charged R groups on the amino acids, which distorts and bends the enzyme. Just like regulatory molecules, the phosphorylation of an enzyme causes a change in its conformation. This conformational change can activate or inactivate the enzyme. If it inactivates the enzyme, then dephosphorylation will activate the enzyme. Phosphorylation is thus a reversible reaction. It's important to understand that enzymes are proteins, and just like any other protein, enzymes can be denatured or rendered completely inoperable by harsh environmental conditions. If the pH of the solution is out of whack, for example, if it's too acidic, then the proteins will have their hydrogen bonds broken and they'll denature and cease to function. The same will happen if the enzyme is exposed to an intolerable temperature extreme or a dangerous level of salinity. With this in mind, it should be understood that proteins and enzymes are also very specialized for their environments. You and I, as human beings, have proteins that function quite nicely at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Extremophile microbes that live in deep sea vents have proteins and enzymes that can withstand the heat of their environments, which can reach over 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So now that you have a pretty decent idea of how individual enzymes work, I want to very, very briefly discuss how groups of enzymes work together. In a metabolic pathway, an enzyme, let's call it enzyme A, will bind to a substrate molecule and catalyze a reaction to create a product. Another enzyme, enzyme B, treats this product molecule as its own substrate, and it'll bind to it and catalyze another reaction. So enzyme B creates its own product. Enzyme C will bind to that and catalyze it to create another product. Then enzyme D will get involved, and so on and so forth. In this way, a base molecule can be passed through a series of enzymes, each one catalyzing a reaction that causes a small modification. By the time the base molecule has reached the end of this series of enzymes, so to speak, the end of the metabolic pathway, it's usually a heavily modified version of its original precursor molecule. At any step along the metabolic pathway, product molecules can be split into groups, and each group can diverge down a branching pathway. This is how you can have one source molecule end up being the precursor for three, four, or five different types of downstream molecules. Metabolic pathways can also self-regulate themselves through feedback inhibition. In many instances, the product of one enzyme in the pathway will inactivate another enzyme, which shuts down the whole pathway. This often happens when the products of a pathway have reached saturation and are no longer needed. The products begin binding to and inactivating their own uncle enzymes, which shuts down the pathway. 
It's evolutionarily advantageous to shut down an enzyme near the beginning of the pathway, so as to not waste resources and energy half-building some kind of product molecule that's never going to make it to completion in the first place. Many of these reactions are catabolic. That is, the chemical pathway generates ATP and carbon compounds by breaking down energy storage molecules, like carbohydrates and lipids. Other reactions use this energy and carbon to build other molecules. These building reactions are facilitated by enzymes in anabolic pathways. These catabolic and anabolic pathways are dual aspects involved in a really important process called cellular respiration. Because you're made of cells, you breathe or you respirate for all of the cells in your body. You do this by inhaling oxygen and exhaling carbon dioxide and water vapor. But I'll save cellular respiration for the next episode. As for energy and enzymes and metabolic pathways, that's about it for this one. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode, and I hope you learned something cool about how the cell uses energy or enzymes or at least the brief basics of metabolic pathways. And as always, thanks for listening.